Aladdin, Strictly Ballroom, all these wonderful plays. What do they have in common, The Boy From Oz? Well, our next guest is been in all of them. So we look forward to speaking to him. <laughs> Hi, welcome to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. This is Joey Buzzatool. And on today's show, we're going to be speaking to a theatre actor who's actually quite done quite well for himself. We're going to hear about his journey and his thoughts on mental health. Mike Snell, how are you? I'm great. Thanks, Joey. How are you? Thanks for having me. No, thank you. I'm good. I'm, I'm really excited to um, be speaking to you. I have been actually holding out for this interview for, for a long time. So before we start, um, I always like to get my guests to introduce themselves. Do you want to tell our listeners maybe a little bit about yourself? Okay. Well, um, my name's Mike and I've spent most of my adult life performing in and out of theatres throughout Australia. Um, I was lucky enough as you mentioned, to start my career alongside Hugh Jackman in the Boy From Oz Arena Spectacular. Um, I then went on to Miss Saigon, uh, Wicked, Hairspray, Legally Blonde. Um, wow. Oh, what else? I've done uh, Strictly Ballroom with Baz Luhrmann, We Will Rock You, a few shows for the production company, and then most recently just came off Disney's Aladdin. So um, that's a bit about me in my career, but I suppose who am I as a person away from all of that kind of... Um, like how like how old are you? Or did, you did you actually grow up in Melbourne? Yeah, I grew up in Melbourne out in uh, Montmorency, which is just out in the suburbs. And I'm 37 years old at the moment. So I'm on the cusp of hanging up my dancing shoes. No, I, really? Well, I don't know. I'm, um, I'm getting into a bit more acting and film and TV acting and stuff like that. So... Yeah, I was actually going to ask you because I'm... This is a very, because I've been interviewing a few TV and movie actors. Um, what is it about, like, how did you discover that you wanted to do theatre rather than going into TV? Well, I was one of those kids that was always singing and dancing around the lounge room, putting on shows for the family. And, you know, I had many opportunities as a young performer to go into film and television, but it just didn't interest me because I needed to dance. Um, and was, I guess there probably wasn't much dancing on TV anyway, was there? Well, no, dancing was big on tally in the 80s. You know, um, there was Solid Gold in Melbourne Tonight, all the Channel Ten, uh, Channel 9 dancers and you know, <laughs> a bit before my time. But my big goals were always to make it in musical theatre. Like I had, I had laser beam um, goal setting when I was in my early 20s. Wow. And in my 30s just to dominate the yeah. Australian musical theatre scene. And that is interesting because it's it's good to know that, you know, I sometimes thought that, that you had to be at, you know, everything, but you obviously followed the path. So what was it like to get your first role? And I guess, can you share with us what it's like to actually audition? Like what's, we see it on television, but what's the process really like? Well, when you're starting out, it is particularly tough to crack your first what we call big break. So I would audition for show after show after show after show and get down to the final cut and then get a call from my agent saying they loved you, but, you know. It's that no, butt, isn't it? You're hearing that butt. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, it's a real tough place to be because you want to give up and, you you know, everything is telling you you're not good enough or you're you're just never going to make it. And, you know, like I remember thinking I, I was auditioning for the original cast of We Will Rock You and I got down to the final cut for the Galileo understudy and I remember saying to myself, <clears throat> I'm going to give it one more crack and if I don't land this show, I'm going to give up. Wow. And luckily enough, that was the boy from Oz. So I remember in that audition, um, dancing for my life like literally every cell in my body was just giving my like I left everything on the table really yeah. you know so you, you sort of like really exposed yourself yeah you yeah you don't think you just feel yeah you, know, you just go for it and when you get that shot there's, you know, four of you that they pick out 
to usually do it in groups of four mm. and the music starts and you're like, I don't know if I'm going to stuff up the choreography. Am I going to get it right? Am I going to shine? And I just remember thinking I've done all the work. I've been in, I have, you know, been in singing lessons every week. I'd been taking dance class every week. And I thought I can't do any more preparation. Yeah. yeah. Do you mind if we just go back to, before the boy of Oz, because you know, this podcast is for men and it is a mental health podcast. So did you feel that, you know, that rejection or that almost getting there, did it, did it, you know, did it impact your mental health? And secondly, do you feel that there is mental health issues in theater or people that want to get into theater? Okay. So when you're starting out, it, you, it doesn't, for me, it didn't really take a toll on my mental health because I was so young. You have a resilience where you just keep cracking at it. You yeah. Gotta, you know, and but, you, but you know, you know, you started in trouble. You know, you said that you were, that was that last audition. Yeah. What was that? Was that mental health or was it just you were over it? When you said, if I don't get this gig, I'm going to give it up. Well, I think it's just, for me, it wasn't so much mental health or I wasn't aware that it was mental health, you know, but for me, it was a, okay, there's got to be a moment where you grow up and think, okay, maybe I'm not cut out for this. Yeah. Am I good enough? Because you keep getting nearly to the end, which tells you that you are in the ballpark. Yeah. It must be so, so hard because there's not enough roles for everyone, is there? No, there's not. But I'll just tell you a story about my mental health. It was actually when I was at the peak of my career mm. doing Legally Blonde, I was playing the UPS delivery guy and I auditioned for Les Mis and got cut first round. Right. Now, I hadn't been cut first round for anything ever. So for me, the mental health um, started like the negative aspects of my mental health started to kick in the more successful I got because I put more pressure on myself to succeed. So when you're starting out, I didn't have high expectations for myself where the further and further I got into my career, the more. Yeah. The pressure was on. Pressure. So and, and did you feel that people around you were expecting more as well? Yeah. And you have a name for yourself and you, you walk in the room and the panel, maybe you've worked with them before. So they're going to see you as a bigger deal and you want to make a better impression. So for me, sometimes it's harder the more successful that I am. Yeah. And when you when you have that situation with Les Mis, I'm just curious if you want to share with us how you dealt with that. Like how did you, you know, because you're pretty aware, you mentioned that you noticed it. So what... How did you start dealing with the um, with that voice in your head? Okay, well, I didn't deal with it well at all. You know, I, in hindsight, I wish I could, re, you know, rewind the clock and use my new coping strategies and self-soothing techniques that I've developed over my mental health journey. But back then, I remember walking out and holding it together and... For me, Les Mis, it was my first musical that I ever saw as a kid. I know every single word. I know every single musical note. I Getting cut for me absolutely sent me into a downward spiral of self-loathing. Um, I remember going straight to the bottle shop and just getting a bottle of wine and not coping at all. Yeah. Um, and so when did you realise that you had to cope? But, you know, when did you... Because you didn't cope with it, what was the wake-up call? Well, the wake-up call for me actually um, was when I noticed that drinking or going into self-soothing techniques that maybe don't serve you or escapism just exacerbate the problem and end up, you know, mounting your stress bucket higher and higher and it fills it up. So, you know, for example, COVID has been a really great um, experience for me to become sober. So today, actually, for me, marks five months of sobriety. Congratulations. Um, yeah, thanks. I just thought, you know, like I 
obviously like you know everyone in the arts our jobs were just taken away from us in the blink of an eye and um I decided that I wanted to either you know sink or swim in this situation and I decided to swim so I've really been focusing on my mental health during COVID not adding you know toxins into my system that are going to make me more depressed or Mm. um you know add to that and I love that because um Firstly, you are, um, you know, it's funny how we think that you guys have this amazing, glamorous life. And mm-hmm. the thing that I've learned about this this podcast is because I've had, you know, like uh, music music people and actors and, you know, they, they make us realise that everyone has mental health issues and can experience those sort of things. And mm-hmm. secondly, it's exciting when people are adapting rather than, you know, you could easily become a victim with the, when COVID came. Yeah. But for you, you chose to adapt. So how have you adapted? Or, you know, also, how do you see this evolving now? With Because I love theatre. And, you know, I bought a whole season of the Melbourne Theatre Company that I couldn't go to. So yeah. how do you see this changing? Well, uh, how do I see theatre changing? I mean... Is there still going to be theatre yet, right? <laughs> yeah. So Frozen, Disney's Frozen, have just started rehearsals last week in Sydney. So right. obviously Sydney are... Uh, leaps and bounds ahead of us in the COVID journey. Um, So I'm not sure what's happening with that. I think they're going to be running at a half capacity. People have to wear masks. I think there might be social distancing. So every third seat in the theatre. Wow. And um, I mean, if that's going to bring us back, then I'm all for it. Yeah. It's interesting, isn't it? Because I actually bought tickets to see Kylie on like coming up and it's weird to, to buy a ticket to a virtual concert and I thought, and then I saw another one for Culture Club. I'm thinking, oh my God, is this going to be the way we're going to see things? Because through COVID, I have to admit, I watched a lot of theatre from the UK and mm-hmm. it was free. And I'm thinking, this is cool. So I think, again, it's evolving and adapting because it doesn't, it doesn't kill it, does it? It doesn't kill the, the art or the um, actual performances. It just means that we may not have access to live theatre as much as we used to. Yeah, and look... As I said, I'm all for adapting, pivoting to survive, but over my dead body, (laughs) uh, audience is a thing of the past. You know, it's just for now. Um, You know, as I said, I went into live theatre because I love the energy exchange. Yeah, can you you talk about that? Like what's... Don't you... Did you get... Did you ever get scared or do you feel like you become a different person once you get on that stage? Oh, definitely. So, you know, you're all backstage. Everyone's taking their beginners uh, positions. Stage management are calling beginners. You hear the orchestra tuning their instruments. The curtain rises and the lights hit you and you do it for the audience. You know, they've paid up to $165 a ticket. They've got babysitters for their kids they've had a night it's a huge night for people to go to the theater Mm -hmm. and you feel blessed to be on the stage doing it for the public it's not just an egocentric um journey of like give me the applause you know you're making them laugh making them cry making them feel something yeah um i feel honored to have lived my life on the stage mm. what about like um and this is just me thinking because I've, I've been to a lot of theater and i thought say you're in the second year of something like how do you cope with doing the same thing do you still have the same vibe even after the, the seventh 70th show okay no you said 700th and that oh, you, 700 that, that's a real thing like i did 500 strictly ballrooms i did close to seven oh my god performances of wicked so I was that, joking. So you so you really do that many? Oh yeah, like a two and a half year contract is approximately five hundred to f- six hundred shows. So you that's when the mental health. Um, what am I trying to say? The does it kick in then? Yeah, like you need to put mental health um procedures in place for yourself. So whether that be making sure you rest. You know, I spent the first three quarters, actually, that's a lie. It was nearly my entire career 
pushing myself to exhaustion. Um, one thing that I learned in the later part of my career for my own mental health was to really use my Mondays, which is the dark day in the theatre, to completely rest, maybe do uh, get a massage, go to the osteopath, do a float. Um, you know, I'd get up first thing on a Monday morning and rush to the gym to do a workout, which I thought at the time was helping my mental health because, as we know, exercise raises endorphins, lowers cortisol. There are so many health benefits to exercise, but if you're doing an eight-show week plus probably six gym sessions a week and three yoga classes, I personally started to really burn out and then yeah. you end up getting injured, calling in sick for shows, which then has an impact on your mental health because, you know, in our industry, yeah, you, never, yeah, you never really want to be taking shows off. So mm -hmm. there is a massive balance um, in an eight-show week over two-and-a-half-year contracts, say like Wicked, Aladdin, Strictly Ballroom, where rest is such an important part of the mental health mm -hmm. um, journey. Can you tell us what it, I mean, I'm sure you would have seen the opposite, you know, is there an opposite of that? Have you seen people that have abused that, like partied and, you know, they've not really looked after themselves and you've watched or witnessed maybe someone lose their focus because they've been caught up in something, maybe mental health or just a distraction? Because I, oh. I think that the reason why you're successful is because of all the things that you're describing, like you're focused and to be a, a you know a long standing performer you need to do the things that you do versus say taking it not taking it seriously yeah and look in the australian musical theatre industry i don't know too many people that don't take it seriously so i've been guilty in the past of snapping into binge drinking at the end of a week or um you know like there is there is that balance because people work so hard mm. then they there's that reward system that kicks in on a sunday night so you've just finished your eighth show for the week say on wicked we were doing five show weekends so you do friday night two saturday two sunday and oh then straight away you know knock off drinks and then you know so there is you know i've been guilty of that in the past but i work hard, play hard kind of attitude. So I would always really back it up. But in the later part of my career, it became very uh, obvious to me that that is not the way to handle yeah. health, mental and physical, you know. Well, I was, I was going to say, like, you can't do that forever, can you? Like, Absolutely not. I'm sure in your 20s you could do it, but then you get, you know, when you're getting older, it's like your body can't. I mean, I'm listening to you and you're just thinking, you're like, you, you are literally, you can't like distract yourself for that whole time of the performance. You are no. switched on, even though you're not on stage. Do you mind maybe sharing with us one or two of your most memorable experiences? Like something that really stood uh -oh. out, like it could be that you've, you know, something good or something bad. I just think that you've, I mean, again, you've shocked me with the fact that you've done 700 shows of Strictly Ballroom. Yeah. Oh my God. It was crazy. <laughs> but look, I'll tell a story that has a very important place in my heart. Um, and that was the death of the wonderful, beautifully talented Rob Guest, who was oh, our, yeah. our wizard in Wicked. And, you know, there's a million amazingly funny stories that I could tell, but just it, you asked me the question and it's jumped out in my, in my memories. And, you know, we were part of a wonderful cast of amazingly talented, beautiful humans who I'm still in love with. And Rob was our guiding light. He was our wizard. And one fateful night, mm. he had a stroke and the very next day slipped away from us. And I will never forget that performance of Wicked where the media was involved, everyone knew, and we had to go on, go on and do a show. And 
you know, we had Debbie Fyland, who's Australia's leading ear, nose and throat specialist for musical theatre performers, come in and teach us how to sing and lower our larynx because we'd all been crying. And um, it was one of the most, one of the hardest performances of my career, but also one of the most electrifying and beautiful exchanges from the audience to the stage. Mm. So we finished the last, we finished the opening number and we're like, wicked, wicked. And we had to hold this pose where we're all lined up along the front of the stage and I swear to you the audience clapped at, in a standing ovation for at least 10 minutes straight. Like, and it was for me a moment of the, the classic line in theatre, the show must go on. Yeah. And it also and, sounds like you guys are so connected and you're like a family. Oh, yes. And we'd, lo- we'd lost our father. You know, yeah. if we're a family, he was most definitely the, the patriarch. And... Yeah. Um, Australian musical theatre royalty and so I know it's a bit sadistic or it's a sad topic to talk about no but no it's beautiful I got, me, I got goosebumps when you yeah it was that. it was one of the most I'll never it was one of it was the most memorable experience of my theatre career yeah do you, just from that like when you said the show must go on do you feel that the producers and the theatre world understands the intensity that you guys work in? Yes, and I think I think the producers of Australia are becoming more and more supportive of mental health um, along the way as well because, you know, it used to be you never go off, you keep slogging, you go, go, go. You know, if you called in sick for say I'm having a mental health day, you would have been laughed laughed at and told to come back in. Mm. When now it's taken very seriously. Um, I know I had a few mental health days in uh, during the Adelaide season of Aladdin. Um, I actually was not coping with some injuries and feeling really, really depressed because I was going out on stage every night and just feeling intense amounts of pain. And Mm. so I actually, you know, called my company manager, Matthew Henderson, who is a wonderful man and explained my situation. And, you know, without the bat of an eyelid, he let me have a couple of days off work, you know, so, and that, and I think that takes balls from the actor's point of view as well these days to be really upfront and honest with how your mental health is, coping because you're away from your family you're you know isolated in maybe a one-bedroom apartment you're working your butt off you know and sometimes that really that can get to you and um you know especially for me after 20 years of doing back-to-back shows um you do you start to miss the simple things in life and um you know, it's mm. it's a real balance to keep yourself mentally in check. Mm. So how important do you feel the theatre, like you're from Melbourne, and so you, you mentioned before that you, you don't know anyone that would have done certain things. Like I think I asked you a question and you said not everyone's really dedicated. So how is, how, how close is everyone? Like do you well, go to auditions and know everyone? Well, pretty much. I mean... You know, I've been around. <laughs> yes. There's not many, there's not many um, directors, musical directors, choreographers that I haven't come across. But um, everyone is pretty close. It's, it's just like any workplace. You know, there's people that you're friendly with, but you may not really get along with. Yeah, I was going to say, is it is it a friendly or is it com- is it competitive? It's very competitive, you know, like we're all there for work. We're all there to get the next show. We're all there to do a great job. You know, understudies are there to shine when the leads can't go on. So there's a definite, there's a definite um, sense of competitiveness. But the minute you turn into a bitchy, diva, well, backstabbing, clawing kind of person, I think that type of behaviour 
kind of gets called out Definitely. because we're all there. We've all been hired. We've all got the talent. So we've, I think, you know, the main focus in a long running show is to have camaraderie and to try and lift everyone rather than drag yeah. everyone down because it's going to then tie into the company morale. And I've, you know, I've been on shows where I remember, you know, at the year and a half mark, the morale for Strictly Ballroom was really low. We were all exhausted. We were all, you know, doing our 350th show. And, you know, the, the gorgeous Cali Abbey came on stage. She was our resident director and, you know, said, guys, look, the vibe's really low in here. It's up to us to tap into joy and to bring the company's morale up. So we did. Wow. And it's just about changing that, that negative script in your head that's maybe telling you you're tired and flipping that script to say, hey, I'm employed. Yeah. How fantastic. So, or what that person said doesn't really matter because in the grand scheme of things, we all love each other. And so it's, it's about, that's another mental health thing is like, what, what is going on in your mind? what is telling you all the time that you're tired or not good enough or that they don't like me or what, whatever it is for each person. So it's like it spreads in a cast, yeah. you know, negativity yeah. can really spread and yeah. so can positivity. So I know that I've been in some really negative places and I've had my beautiful cast mates pull me out of that. Yeah. And I know that I've seen some of my cast mates go down and, I've helped them out, you know, so it's, I don't know, it's like a well-oiled machine and I feel that there are some really, really great people in our in our Australian industry mm. that are always there to help. And it's good that, you know, I think it's good that mental health is now becoming a normal thing and there's no, I think that, you know, in the 60s and 70s and 80s, mm. that whole diva, you know, behavior was probably not called out and I think as we've evolved now people are wanting you know to have a good work life and a good um, relationship with yeah. their with their workers so yeah. it's good and um, just the last question like what where, where, where are you what's next for you like I'm curious to know why you never did you go overseas or is that something you didn't want to do no I I actually won a reality TV show called I Will Survive, which was based on Priscilla Queen in the Desert. And we traveled from Sydney to Alice Springs on a bus, on the Priscilla bus. Oh my God, this, I remember that. <laughs> yeah. And then we went from LA, Vegas, where I ended up winning the show in New York. So I had my little New York moment. But for me, I just love Australia. I love the shows here. I love the princess theater her majesty's theater the sydney lyric theater the capital qpac um you know adelaide festival theater you know burswood in perth i love our theaters and i love working here and i get to see my family i work with my friends and i had i had the opportunity to go to new york and i made the decision not to wow okay. yeah whether that was out of fear of failure or just me wanting, I don't know if I wanted to live in New York. Yeah. And the thing is that you made it, like, what do you think? Do you think, well, this is the hypothetical, but do you think your life would have been totally different? It would have been, wouldn't it? Because, you know, do you think that if you went to New York, you would have had the success that you had here? I'd like to think so, because <laughs> I'm... The, the cool thing about Australia is that all the um, amazing Broadway directors and producers and musical directors, they audition us. So you go to New York and you've already met half of the who's who of, you know, New York theatre anyway, because, you know, Stephen Aramis, for example, the amazing music composer, music director, you know, auditioned me for Wicked. Um, I've worked with Jerry Mitchell. Um, on, like, so I'd like to think that if I did go to Broadway, I would have given it a good hot, hot crack and... I think you would have as well. And cracked it. But at the same time, maybe not. Like, who knows? And that's that's something I need to live with because I don't have regrets, but it is something that sits in the back of my mind. And 
I think to myself, oh. Well, you're still young. So is there, well, like, what is next? Are you, if you don't, you said that you're going to put your dancing shoes up. So what does that mean? Do you become, well, do you become more of a teacher or do you become more no, of something else? I've actually just set my five-year goals and I've got some pretty big goals for film and television here in Australia. And um, okay. I want to do a lot of hosting um, for TV shows. And I mean, I'd like to do some drama series as well, but I, I really love hosting. You know, I feel, my, I feel that I'm a natural MC and um, it's scary to reset goals, you know, speaking of mental health, you know, like to believe in yourself is one of the hardest things to do, to really truly start again in a new genre, in a new industry, you know, like I am very scared. I'm very daunted. But, that isn't that, but that's the thing that's, that's attractive about you because or anyone that makes it to your level, I think that you need, again, I'm only going on what I've seen or heard in interviews, the people that make it are people like you that have that vision and they don't just just work on a whim. You know, they work really hard. And I've, look, I've just met you, but I totally believe that you will make it a TV and, because you have that, that ethics of manifesting what you want. Do you feel that you are hooked into manifesting the life that you want? Yeah, like, look, without without sounding contrived or anything, I feel that I'm a master manifester when I put my mind to something. Yeah. But it all comes from hard work. Um I've Yeah, you've had no shortcuts, have you? No, never. I've yeah. worked for everything that I've ever got in my life. And that's why I wanted to interview you because that's the inspiration that I want to send out to our listeners and to the youth and all that. Because a lot of people nowadays want, you know, if you look at like influences on social media, like people want to get famous without doing the work. And everyone that I've interviewed that has come from a creative background, their story is the same. If you want to get somewhere, you've got to work. And so I think it's important to revisit that ethic because it's, you know, only a few people make it if they're not going to have any talent. Yeah. I mean, I've got no interest in being a, you know, <coughs> uh, it's like, it's like popcorn. It's like sugar, you know, it's just going to give you a, a rush for five minutes and then you don't remember the glass of Coke that you drank, you know, like I want, I'm not interested in fizzling for five seconds. You know, I've had a career that spanned 20 years with, no breaks in between, not just from luck, but from non-stop training, creating long-lasting relationships. Um, sacrificing probably as well. Sacrifice, yeah, but and enjoying what I do. You know, I've had a lot of anxiety um, over the years to do with my performance, you know, and that's one of the main things that I'm working on at the moment is not letting my anxiety and nerves ruin my experience. You know, I, I can be backstage shaking and just thinking to myself, oh, my God, am I going to stuff this up? Like, are they gonna, is the audience going to like what I'm doing? Am I going to get the laughs if it's a comedic role? Um, and that, that can be crippling, you know, and... For me, if I don't look after myself, if I don't breathe, um, breath for me is everything. You know, sometimes I, I, I'm sitting there and I'm like, I don't even think I'm breathing. Like, just take a deep breath, Michael. And so, you know, when setting new goals, um, yeah, I hope I can achieve them. That's yeah. all. Okay. You totally inspired me. I hope that our listeners are inspired by you. I really want to wish you all the best. And I really want to say a big thank you for, 
you know, I stalked you on <laughs> Facebook and you said yes. So uh, thank you so much for trusting in me to come on the show and share your wonderful story with us and inspire us. Thank you so much, Michael. No worries. Thank you so much for having me, Joey. It's been my pleasure. That's okay. You've been listening to the Secret Men's Business Podcast. The podcast are out on Mondays and Thursdays, and now we're on YouTube. So don't forget to look up SMB TV to get this interview on YouTube. Don't forget to click the like button and subscribe. I'll see you all next time, guys. Bye. Mm-hmm.